Tonight on Heather Parisi Live, my special guest is Jedediah Bila. Welcome, Jedediah, and thank you so much for being my special guest tonight. How are you? Yes, thank you for having me on. Yes, I'm doing well, great. I'm doing great. It, wait one second. It's 11 a.m. though, right? It is 11 a.m. That's right. Do you know what time it is here? I do 12, not. 12 midnight. <laughs> Oh, so a late night for you? Yes, a late Listen, night. I'm glad, I'm glad it's not midnight on this end because I would be asleep and that would be a very <laughs> bad interview. So just let's be lucky that it's, it's flipped the way that it is. Okay. Listen, <laughs> I have to be blunt. I had absolutely no idea who you were. I left the United States when I was 19. I spent 30 years in Italy uh, where I was an entertainer, a television entertainer. And 12 years ago, I moved to Hong Kong with my, uh, with my family. And then I came across a video of yours on Twitter. I think I watched it two or three times continuously and boom, I like the way you think. I love your philosophy. I read your book and I said to myself, I want to interview that woman. So how are you and how is the situation in New York? I'm doing great. And thank you very much um, for all of those compliments. I appreciate them very much. The situation in New York is crazy. Um, you know, we are leaving, actually. You know, I can announce now. I don't think I've said this yet, but we're going to be moving to South Florida uh, oh. in the beginning of April. And it's been very sad for me to make that decision because I'm a New Yorker. I love right. this city. I know. Uh, it was a beautiful I city. I grew up in this city, but it has really gone uh, the way of madness. And I just can't justify raising my child here, given what's going on in the city, not just with respect to the mandates, but also with respect to the crime. Um, it, it's it's the, the lockdowns. I mean, they've really decayed morally and otherwise. Uh, and I just I just don't want to be here anymore. And it's it's been really a, a tough decision and a sad one. But I'm excited for this ne next step in a more free free thinking space. We're thinking about the same thing here in Hong Kong, but maybe we'll talk about that in private. <laughs> anyway, if it's okay yeah. for you, I mean, again, we're on the same wavelength uh, also on that uh, subject. If it's okay for you, I would like to use your new book, which is Dear Hartley, Thoughts on Character, Kindness, and, a build and Building a Brighter World. Let's see the cover. Oh my God, one question before I ask you all the other things. Did Hartley pose spontaneously? I mean, was it difficult? Because he's small there. So did he just sit there yeah. and smile and be charismatic as he is? Or did you have to say, listen, I'll give you a lollipop. I'll give you a popsicle. I'll give you anything you want, Doritos, yeah. but you've got to pose and smile. So was it easier or was it you hard? Know, he was pretty good, um, yeah. but it was really funny for some of the shots. We have a four pound dog, Daisy, uh, who's oh. adorable. And oh. at one point, my husband was like holding the dog above <laughs> the baby <laughs> so that he would laugh because he's really good about everything, but you know, he's not going to laugh on cue. He wasn't even right. two years old at that point, but we were surprised. We wound up with a lot of really good shots for the book cover uh -huh. and he was really well behaved, but Daisy always helps. Daisy's like, you know, he doesn't have a sibling. So Daisy is his sibling and he doesn't know. Okay. He's like, oh, she's one right. of me she's another kid so, so it was, was, easy. Kind of, it was it a really, really really fun shoot okay yeah so i'm gonna use your <laughs> exactly. book i'm gonna use your book as a sort of guide to talk about you so why and when did you decide to write it so I decided I actually had a whole other book planned and had gotten okay. an advance and had gotten an offer from two publishers it was supposed to be about education it was going to be much more political and much more serious and I decided that and by serious I mean um research based right right I you know, started the lockdowns in mm -hmm. New York and was spending a lot of time, just me, my husband and my child, my parents as well. And just my kid didn't have access to so many things that a kid right. ordinarily would, couldn't play yes. with other kids, couldn't go to like, you know, any kind of play center. Right. Everything was shut down. Even and I just realized that right? I wanted Even That's the right. I mean, that's uh, right. I mean, we took him outside. We, we yeah, never stopped course, doing that. Right, right. 
Exactly. But I, yeah. I just felt like I had so much to say to him. And mm -hmm. as as the, the madness evolved in New York, so much to say to the country about mm -hmm. what was going on. And just I had a lot in my head about how I really wanted him to grow up to be a free thinking person that had autonomy over his own health and well-being and, you know, had the courage of his convictions to speak his mind. And I realized it wasn't just a book for my kid. It was a book for right. the whole next generation and for parents and guardians and uh -huh. everyone, every one of us who finds ourselves in a position where it's like, mm -hmm. do I speak out on this issue? I wanted right. to remind everyone that you should, you absolutely should. So that's why I wrote it. Um, okay. And it was hard to put out there because, you know, it had my kid on the cover and it was a little bit right. scary, but it was it was a necessary book for an important time. Lynn, reading your book, I found some many similarities between you and me, the way you think, but also your life experience. When you were a teenager, what did you want to become? What was your I wanted to be an actress. An actress? Oh, I wanted to be an actress <laughs> so badly. I and you know, I was really good at it. Is the is yeah? the, I was very shy. I was very shy and I okay. could not break that. I hmm. could not break it, but I was really good. My mom was a performing arts teacher and she taught acting classes out of our home. And I always say that was really my skill. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a good student and I could do other things, but like acting was something that came really naturally to me. I was that kid that used to perform at other kids' houses and make everyone laugh. Right. And I just didn't have the guts to do it. I mean, and that's really... I wrote about it because I wanted to tell my kid, don't be like me, you know, right? be gutsy, because even <laughs> be if gutsy, I had failed, right? yeah. I would have known like, yeah. oh, okay, you know, so I, there is not a day that to this day, I'll see projects and I'll be like, oh, I would love to do that. It's very hard to pivot from where I am right now, well, because my opinions are everywhere, but <laughs> I, I love acting. That was my first love. Well, when I was a little girl, I always dreamed about being Carla Fracci. I love Carla Fracci. And I was so lucky that one day she came to my TV show in Italy, which was Al Paradise, which won also Festival di Montreux. And she came as my guest, and we did a really famous uh, dance together. It was like nine minutes long, Can Can. So if you ever get to see it on YouTube, it was like, it was a total dream come true because all of my friends from San Francisco Ballet and American Ballet Theater in New York, I wrote to them saying, Carla Fratch is my guest. She's coming to my TV show. <laughs> so for me, it was, like a, it was like a dream come true. Okay, you said before, you define yourself shy, super shy. And I quote, mm -hmm. um, which might surprise those who see me passionately voicing my thoughts on television. So I'm not surprised mm -hmm. at all because the same thing happens to me. I don't know if it happens to you, but when I have to dance and sing live on a TV show, I always get butterflies in my stomach. But when I see that little teeny right, red light flash on on the camera, my shyness vanishes. Is this the same thing for you? Yeah, you know, I always, I'm very shy in my personal life and I'm not terribly social, you know, I'm really okay. not. Um, I have very, you know, I have a few really good friends, but I'm not someone who has cast a wide net when it comes to acquaintances. I'm not out and about all the time, but I always felt that, you know, studios and camera felt like home. Like I, right. I it sounded right. odd to people, but I wasn't really drawn. I was really drawn to the television business mm -hmm. initially. I wasn't it wasn't about politics. I mean, I started writing about pets. I started writing about right. fitness, politics as well. But I wasn't this politico that was like, oh, I've worked for a politician and I went to journalism school and I'm, you know, my I have a political family. That wasn't what it was about for me. I was really drawn to the medium of entertaining people and making them laugh and smile and having a real conversation in a space that felt really comfortable for me where cameras were. That was just so how I grew no up butterflies, around all no, of that. No butterflies at all? You know, I do get I do get a little, but it's more like, um, you know, it's a little bit different, though. Like right now, I'm not playing someone else. I'm right. You're I'm just yourself. me. I'm just out there yeah, giving okay. my opinion. So I think it's right. a little bit different. When I was okay. doing acting showcases when I was in my early 20s, uh -huh. I would get those butterflies because then you're memorizing lines and you're right, becoming right. another person. And that's like a whole different type of excitement. Um, right. So I, I, I definitely hear what you're saying. Okay. So there, there are so many cues and hints and meditations in your book that it would be impossible to talk about them all. So forgive me, but I chose the most important for me. A lot of one chapter, and I have to say, if the people don't know who haven't read your book yet, every chapter is dedicated. It's like a letter to your precious Hartley. And this chapter is dedicated to labels. And you say, labels are for packages, and Hartley, and I imagine all of us, is not a package. How true is that? 
That's right. That's an important message that uh, I came to learn and understand. Um, and the reason was that, you know, people, when I first wrote, when I wrote my first book, actually called out numbered, I wrote Chronicles of a Manhattan Conservative. And then I sat with that and I said, well, what does that word mean? I knew conservatives right. that were supporting big government policies. Uh -huh. I knew conservatives that you could have two conservatives in a room that saw the world completely differently. Right. So what does that mean? You know, you can talk to someone who's, you know, a vegan and they can eat, you know, all processed garbage. And then you can uh -huh. talk to someone who's a vegan who eats a beautiful plant-based diet. So what I decided right. at some point was just tell people what you stand for and what you believe in and forget that label because odds are it's not going to tell you anything about that person other than the fact that they have a fancy label and it doesn't mean anything. So I think that's been really true in politics, but also in life in general. Okay, but don't you think that labeling people is just sort of laziness? Because I only label people yeah. that are evil, people that have a dark heart. <laughs> I do. I don't label the normal people or people that I encounter or my friends or anything or family, but I do label the, the dark heart people. And isn't it easy to stick a label to a person than trying to understand who they really are, who they truly are? Yeah, I do think it's lazy. I think in the world mm. of the politics is also convenient because they want that. They want to be able to stick, oh, Republican, Democrat, go fight. They like people who tow a certain line at all costs. Mm -hmm. They want to be able to put you into a box politically as opposed to just have a free thinking person having a normal conversation that, you know, you may surprise them with your views every now and then because that's what normal free thinking people do. They, they're they unpredictable. So I do think it's lazy. Um, and I do think it's it's easy sometimes to do that, but it's much more interesting to actually sit and say, what does this person really stand for? I know they're the, calling themselves a liberal, but what does that mean right, to them? Right, does that right. mean big government? Does that mean pro-mandate? Uh -huh. Does that mean pro-freedom, actually? And they uh -huh. like the word liberal and think that voting for liberal politicians is in their best interest, but maybe it's not. Or, you know, what does that really mean? And I think it promotes conversation, which honestly is the enemy of a lot of these cable news structures. They don't want you talking to each other. They want you yelling at each other. And those right. labels facilitate that. They don't want peace. They want to see people not getting along, which is something even the, 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 the normal citizen, they do not want us to get along. They seem to be happy right. and thrive on seeing people disagree with one another. And as you said, they like seeing people scream at each other instead of talking with peace in your mind, right? Well, yeah, because it's they feel that it's good for ratings and okay. they feel that it's a business model. You know, every single cable news in particular, but also network television is the same way. They feel that they have an audience. They've decided that that audience is predictable. Like this mm -hmm. is what the audience wants. Right. So they but is it, they go on TV. Is it what the audience wants? I don't wants? know. I don't think so. And I think I that's in fact I know it's not. And, and there's and the, that, that's the reason yeah. why a lot of people are flocking to spaces like podcasting, and because they're tired, they're like, I don't need to turn on my television and hear predictable talking points anymore. We're now in an age where there are other options. And there's better conversations happening in spaces like this. They're longer. Mm -hmm. You can get to more stuff. You're not cut off. It's not about sound bites. True. And it's unpredictable, which is right. really interesting. And how mm -hmm. the real world works. You don't go to someone's house for dinner and there's like a preset list of talking points that everyone says. That's not real life. So they want no. something that feels real and authentic, you know? Right, right. Listen, I want to go back to the infamous video at ABC in November. So... Okay, Jen. So let's discuss. Yeah. Let's address the elephant in the room because you were supposed to join. You <laughs> yeah. were supposed to join us in the studios mm -hmm. weeks ago, but you couldn't because ABC has a very strict policy. Uh, you can't get into this building unless you're fully vaccinated. Everybody in this room knows that and is vaccinated. But you mm -hmm. made a conscious decision not to get the vaccine. Now, the CDC says a person is 10 times less likely to be hospitalized from COVID and 11 times less likely to die if they've gotten the vaccine. OK, so why didn't you get it? Yeah, so my story is a little bit unique. I'll share that first before I get into those CDC numbers. But Remember, we have I only actually a have certain a medical... amount of time, Jed, if you want to get everything yeah, in. I have, right. So I want, to, I want to let people know why I'm not there. I have a medical exemption to the vaccine that's been written by my infectious disease vaccinated specialist in New York City that's been co-signed by three other doctors. I'm not a candidate for this vaccine. I also have sky-high, multi-tiered, multifaceted natural immunity, very, very high, that has also been proven, it has been shown, and it is substantiated by letters from these doctors. So for me, personally, 
this vaccine poses a greater risk than a benefit. I'm also not a risk to any of you. I know there's been a lot of debate about that, but I have these doctors who've gone on record with that as well. So my point about all of this is that I am not anti-vax. What I really want is for people to make these decisions for themselves. I want every one of you to sit with your family members, to sit with your trusted doctors and to say, what is the best decision for me? However, I do oppose mandates. I oppose them on the fact that Let's look at the science. This is a vaccine that was created to prevent severity of disease and to prevent hospitalizations. Now, we can have a whole debate on that in itself, but the vaccine does not prevent you from getting COVID and does not prevent you from transmitting COVID. Oh, my COVID. goodness. Well, no, and we have that's seen that. not so. Come on. No, You've been at Fox TV too long. You don't have to enjoy. <laughs> you don't have to listen to me on that. You don't have to listen to me. You can listen to the director of the CDC. You can look at the CDC's website. <laughs> that is why masks were reinstated for people who were vaccinated, because they said, and they admitted, they came out and said, this for this Delta variant, transmission I is going I, to be a thing for vaccinated and you know unvaccinated what, people. So I'm not opposed to the vaccine, you know but what, I am opposed to the mandate 100% on the grounds of science. 762,000 people have died from COVID, including right. Manny's in-laws. And I just, we've been friends a long time, but I just, uh, Manny's parents, I just don't understand why you would choose to prioritize your personal freedom over health and safety of others. So and I just, I just, I just, I just so really again, don't think that we again, should allow Sonny, this kind of misinformation. Again. Um, on, Again, on Sonny, our website. I am we've prioritizing. Had US, you, we've had the United States Surgeon General debunk. Yes, I heard what he said. Everything that you've just said, and I, I just don't think no. we should we should so a, when you allow have the this Surgeon kind General of misinformation on, all, on our air. I'm, yeah. Sonny, I'm really sorry, Sonny, my friend. First of all, I'm really sorry, Sonny, my friend. First of all, I would say to you as a friend, what I just said to you is, I am prioritizing my health, and people talk about the common Over good. Over the health and safety of other people. You're not going to have the common good people. if you're not prioritizing your own health. You Over have the Surgeon General. This should sound very. This should sound very. Very familiar you guys aren't to you, Jed. This should sound very familiar to you. We got to go to break, and so I have to say, <laughs> uh, thanks to Jed Follow and Diabela, people. You can buy Jed. How did you feel when it happened, and did you feel that aggressiveness was coming upon you? I was surprised. Um, and I know people say, well, why would you be surprised? It's the view, you know, I worked there. And no, I don't want to interrupt were... you. I don't want to interrupt you, but I, they were, these ladies were your colleagues and they were also your friends. So that's correct. I mean, you know, it, Sunny came to my wedding. Like she, I considered her a friend, you know, everyone else I was, I, I wrote Whoopi from time to time. Um, Sarah and I, Sarah actually, you know, put a quote on the back of the book for me. Right. She's, you know, when came I know to her your, family. Your... When came to your wedding, right? Also as well? Sunny did, yes, yes. Ah. So I felt like, and not only that, you know, I had been very public about how I felt about right. vaccine mandates. So okay. you weren't getting a surprise. I also did a full pre-interview with them where I laid out, this is how I feel. Are you guys sure that you're comfortable with this viewpoint? Is that, and I was assured, yeah, you know, we're gonna do hot topics because we want to have this conversation with you. And it's a viewpoint that's not being represented. So I actually felt, pretty comfortable going in there and saying, you know what, we're just going to disagree, which we had done many times on that show before. Right, I did right. work there for a year and a half. Um, I was not expecting to be shot down for misinformation instantly. It wasn't misinformation, what I was saying. You know, I've since been proven correct. I was correct no, at the time, fact, but many studies have come in and supported what I've said, but um, I was not anticipating that. I, I was surprised. Okay. So do you think that now, since it is crystal clear that everything you said was and is mm -hmm. true, they would attack you or would the mood be different? I think, I don't know. I don't know. I think they would still feel mm -hmm. justified and have to, and maybe, maybe, look, maybe that's why I'll never be invited back. I don't know. I don't know if I ever would be invited back, but I think it would be really hard to not apologize or to not say, hey, you know, you were right. And that's what life's about, right? Like, I get it. People, people make mistakes. People are wrong. I've been wrong before. You come right. out, you know, you do the right thing. You say, I you was need wrong. To apologize. I was wrong on this. I'm sorry. You, but you need I don't to see that coming. I don't see that coming. And really no. what I was just saying was, hey, I had a medical exemption. My doctor right. had decided this was not the right path for me. And that natural <clears> immunity <throat> was a real thing. And now we know that natural immunity was stronger than vaccinated fact, immunity throughout fact. Delta. It's been proven. I was also citing the CDC, you know, which I don't, you know, love. I don't think the CDC has done a great job at all. But the CDC had come out and said, vax people also get and spread this virus. That was just a fact I was saying. So 
it wasn't about telling people whether or not to get vaccinated. I really right, was right, just right. supporting people's individual decision. Um, and I was surprised. So I don't know what that would look like for me to go. I mean, but you'd have to say, Jed, we're sorry, because I was cut off, not because you disagree with me. Feel free to disagree with me. Like, right, that's what right. this is all about. True, in fact, But don't cut me off and label me misinformation when, in fact, what I was saying was, was true and has since been proven by numerous outlets to have been true. I have seen that video 20 to 30 times. I'm serious. <laughs> and I, we're not sisters. We're not cousins. We're not even relatives. But I had steam coming out of my ears, and I was looking at you so calm and so cool. Yes. <laughs> and they were so evil to you, and you just, you were such a lady, very classy. And I just, I really want to compliment you, and you do deserve an apology because it's just not happened. I wanted to ask you what's happening to journalism in the United States and all over the world. I mean, why has it become so prone uh, to power and, and economical interests rather than to truth and investigation as a service for the people. Yeah, well, everything is agenda driven now, you know, and that's a reality. And I think the unfortunate reality with an issue like this, you know, typically you have mainstream media alliance with usually the Democrat Party in the United States. That's right. just how it works. Um, but this was a little bit different because this was a big pharma issue. And the mm -hmm. reality is that big pharma funds a lot of these networks. They, you know, there was a video circulating for a while with all of these shows that we've heard of Anderson Cooper and all of these that it was like brought to you by Pfizer and brought to you by Pfizer. I well, know, how do you I expect know. any any news organization to be able to be objective when that's that's the reality that they're living with, you know, which is that they need their money and they rely on their money. So, you know, I think I think that made this issue a little bit different um, because it wasn't just about politics. It was about the pharmaceutical company. It was about a lot of money and a lot of people in positions of power. But it, it is very sad. There seems to be a, a lack of interest in just asking questions. Now it's even to question science. I mean, you're not, right. if you ask a question, you're vilified, you're canceled, you're removed from social you're media. You're censored. You know, you're censored. As a journalist, you're, you're oftentimes <laughs> fired. I mean, right. listen, I've been fired before. I always say in this industry, if you haven't been fired, then you're just not doing it right because it <laughs> fired means that you're actually asking questions and you don't have an allegiance to a politician or a political party. That's really what it amounts to in 2022 to be in political right. media. Um, but um, yeah, there's just a profound lack of interest. And that's why people don't trust the media because they're like, I don't need propaganda. I just want questions being asked mm -hmm. and answered. And I want to be able to figure out what's going on for myself. Um, and know that not everybody's in the pockets of a politician or, you know, a big pharma distributor. Um, so it's a big problem. As you know, I live in Hong Kong. And unfortunately, the situation is, is out of control because this policy of zero COVID cases is totally unsustainable. And I have three countries in my heart, my own country, the United States, the country where, where I became famous, Italy, and the country where I'm living now, which is Hong Kong. For different reasons and in different ways, all these countries applied some of the toughest restrictions during the pandemic, and they still do. And I'm, and I'm talking about freedom restrictions. In Italy, <laughs> you cannot work. You cannot go to work. You cannot go to a bank. You cannot go to a shop, only if you are vaccinated. Starting on February 24th here in Hong Kong, you, you literally can go nowhere if you're not mm -hmm. vaccinated. So I'm saying this to you, and this is true, I just found out. I cannot go grocery shopping. I cannot go to a supermarket. So our 11-year-old mm -hmm. twins, Elizabeth and Dylan, will be doing the grocery shopping for their family. So this is what I want to ask you, which I can't even believe I'm saying this to you because we were mm -hmm. talking about leaving New York, which is you love New York. I visually love Hong Kong. We've been here 12 years and I adore China and I adore Hong Kong. But unfortunately, something snapped. So in our country, the United States, they tried to do the same more or less, but Americans said, uh-uh, not happening. So it seems Some. to me that we Americans have the antibodies against limitations of our freedom. So please, what do you think about this? Some, I would say some do. You know, you looked at okay. places throughout the United States like Florida, 
looked very different from New York right. City. DeSantis, um, you look at places like Governor Texas DeSantis. even. It, it really depends on where you live in the United States. Right, Some right, people right. just said, I'm not going to tolerate that. And you have protections. For example, in mm -hmm. states like Tennessee, in states like uh, Florida, in states, you know, those are states that, in states like Texas, you have protection if you have natural immunity. You know, you're not right. going to, if you're working for a company, there's going to be things they can't do. They can't just say fired out the door. There are exemptions that exist, medical exemptions and whatnot. Now, if you look at a place like New York City, though, mm -hmm. I mean, truly, everyone in New York City for the, I mean, vast, vast, vast majority bowed down and said, okay, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do it. I mean, in you have five-year-olds that can't walk into a restaurant and eat a sandwich at a cafe. Mm -hmm. Now, none of this makes sense, of course, because as I said, vaccinated people can get and spread the disease. So this is not about transmission. Mm -hmm. That's not what's happening here. It's about controlling people. And I think that there are parts right. of the country, unfortunately, that, I mean, you look at what's going on in Canada with the truckers and that movement. We didn't do that in the United States. We should have. There should have been something comparable in the land of the free. That didn't happen. So I think no. there has been some resistance mm -hmm. in the United States. There have been, even in New York City, there were some protests. But not enough. I mean, they got away with a lot of stuff. I mean, people getting fired, nurses who already, you know, had been prior infected right. and had immunity, getting fired, doctors, same thing. Um, a lot of bullying that went on, school children. There's a lot that's gone on but, with masking why, um, why long people, after the data came out. Why do the people seem like they're sleeping? Not that they're lobotomized, because if you by any chance say to someone... The people are lobotomized. They get so offended. I know what I'm doing. I want the vaccine and I this and I that. I'm going to say to you, why are they a little bit sleeping, a little bit dozed off? It seems well, like they're just not catching on. Well, and maybe they did want the vaccine and that's fine, but that's not the debate. The debate is if you wanted the vaccine, go get it. But you should, if you care about people's freedom and you care about science and you care about people's rights, then you should be someone who's saying, I opted for the vaccine. I think it's the right thing to do, but I'm not going to tell anyone else what to do. Right. That was where the fight That's, was. It wasn't yes. about the vaccine. It was about should people be forced or face a consequence? And people say, well you had a choice still. No, that's not what freedom looks like. Freedom no. is not, well, you can lose your job if you want to, unless you get this medical treatment that may be advised against by your own physician. That's not freedom. That's tyranny. Right. So I think there are a lot of people use the word lobotomized. I often use the word hypnotized. Okay. People are too comfortable in this country and with following authoritarian leadership. They are too comfortable with politicians that have a lot of power, with big pharma execs that have a lot of power, and they're just used to it. It's a, it's like a creeping normality. It's like a slow, invasive, you know, normality where they they kind of take over your life little by little, and suddenly you're like, oh my gosh, but, I don't have any control over anything anymore. But doesn't it seem like they want someone to command them? Mm hmm. So there's a segment of the population that, I guess, is very comfortable with that structure, oh. that finds a false sense of security in that structure, that likes to be told what to do, and that doesn't question authority. Those are the people that, in dictatorships, just follow along. And then ultimately, they face the consequences of those actions. Then there are people in the country and every country that say no, that naturally resist authoritarian leadership and naturally ask questions and want autonomy over their own decision making. So I think what it has exposed is not only the differences regionally throughout the country in terms of mm -hmm. if, if you want a certain type of lifestyle, you, you live here, not here, but also just the differences in people throughout the country and how some would be willing to take an enormous amount of control away from their own hands when it comes to their own life and others just aren't going to have it. Um, and it's it's been a really interesting um, social experiment, so to speak, to watch unfold. An unfortunate one and a very costly one to many, but it's been fascinating to watch uncover. One of the chapters in your book is dedicated to mindset reset, and you cannot imagine how much I need it. And I think a lot of people need it after what happened. Yeah. So what do you suggest to do? I mean, I read that you use, that you use, that you watch the 1990s uh, TV shows yes. uh, to relax. Is it true? Yes. Uh, it's absolutely true. Um, I, I love like 90210 and I grew up in a world where it was like Dawson's Creek and 90210 and I go there mentally because it's that was a time in my life that was very simple and peaceful and it brings me back to that time. But yeah, right. people need to find a way. You know, I also use the sauna. I have an infrared sauna, a portable one at home that I bought. I, I do that. I meditate. I exercise. Uh -huh. You have to find a way 
to kind of get your head into a place where you're not allowing news cycles to do what they want to do, which is to make you crazy. They need you angry and crazy and wired and your whole neurological system like frayed. You know, think of like a telephone wire that gets frayed. That's great for them because then you keep it on and you're getting angrier and you're mad on social media. And you have to find a way to, yeah, you can express yourself. You can read my tweets. I get mad plenty, but I leave that <laughs> space and I go and I go out for a run. That I don't carry that energy with me. That's not, I mean, you see now, you asked earlier about my appearance on The View. That's yeah. me. Like it's, I'm very hard to ruffle. Like you're not going to ruffle my feathers easily. You I'm a per, Brooklyn you know, girl. So in, Ita in Italiano, <laughs> eh, eh, non perdere, non perdi mai le staff. You don't uh, lose your cool. You didn't, you don't, you just, right. you're so, you, you sit there and you listen to them and you let, they say anything, but you just, you're so, nobody, yeah. as you said, ruffles your feathers. Interesting. And I don't know if you know this, but I am Italian. I'm, you know, Naples and Sicily. I'm a split. Oh, really? And I Down south. Crazy... Fabulous. Yeah. I, I grew up with a, in a crazy Italian family. Okay. I mean, it was a Brooklyn Italian family, but, and it was like food and yelling and all right. sorts of colorful language. And you just kind of Ma learned that like, Gelidaia. I feel, Pali yeah. Pali Italiano. No, I speak Spanish, but I don't speak Italian. I can read Italian, but I okay. don't speak because Italian. It's similar but to... I know you just asked me if I speak Italian because it's, you know, my Spanish <laughs> comes understood. out. But um, yeah, I do. I do. I understand a lot of, of Italian. Um, part of my they... master's degree, I had to learn how to read it. So I can oh, okay. read it, but I don't speak it so well. Because no, I'm. But yeah, you I... learned. You're like, you know, I feel like, you know, your energy too. You grow up and you're just like, you can, you're sturdy. I feel very right. sturdy. So I'm like, Give it your best shot. You're not going to ruffle my feathers, you know? <laughs> I love it. I love it. I really admire you on that. So I really love the idea to write a book made up of letters to your precious one, to your little Hartley. So I think that this generation of kids is the most vulnerable and the most hit by the way this pandemic is being, how we can say, managed. They are the ones who are paying uh, most of the consequences and of all of the mistakes that have been done. And they have been terribly overshadowed to preserve adults. So do you think they will be able to, how do you say, come around and overcome all of the suffering in terms of social distancing, masks, and unfortunately fear? Well, I think you're going to have some, you know, I, I worked in schools for a long time. I mm -hmm. used to be a teacher. And I think you're going to have some significant, you're already seeing them, developmental delays, speech delays, reading delays. Yeah. But And I the think mask, those right. will remedy. You can remedy those. Those, a lot of them is from not only the children wearing masks, but adults around them teaching them. You can't teach kids how to read and how to pronounce things with a mask no. on. It's absurd. I mean, anyone who's it's taught in a classroom knows this is wildly Absolutely dangerous ridiculous. stuff that's been going on for a, a pretty long time. Um, in terms of concealing faces and whatnot. But I think the bigger challenge is going, because that stuff can be remedied with time. Mm -hmm. The bigger challenge is the impact on, like, you have children now that are afraid of social interaction. They feel that it's somehow threatening. They're scared of other children, like, oh, my gosh, am I going to get sick? They're a, they've used these masks as a shield, a protective shield, so they don't have to face those interactions. So shy kids now feel protected by, oh, I'm in a mask, so... I don't have to worry about putting myself out there to make friends or it's it's very unhealthy what's gone on. And also they've processed in their minds. Some kids, I mean, have really only known a world with COVID. So in their minds, they view other people as scary and threatening and dangerous and the whole world outside a little bit scary. That is not normal, especially because COVID was not a problem for kids. I mean, 99.997% plus survival rate in children. And right. many of those, the children who did have an issue had, you know, wild comorbidities. And it's it's really, really unbelievable. My kid was exposed to COVID. He was four months old. He didn't get so much as a sniffle. In fact, at the time, I thought he got eczema as a result of it. I write about that in the book. We found out a few months later that that was, that was as a result of a food allergy he had at the time and had nothing. He had no symptoms. Um, so it, I think it's, I think there are going to be a lot of parents and guardians that wake up and realize what have we done to children? What have we done in the name of, you know, great parents who just lost their minds, really I lost think, their minds. I also think that they're created, unfortunately, a little miniature 
hypochondriacs because I'm going to tell you yes. just a teeny story, teeny story, and then I have two minutes left to, to, to ask you my famous Heather's questionnaire. So you know, we were out with a whole bunch of kids. We were walking along the harbor here in Hong Kong. It was a beautiful day. And um, my kids de despise the mask. They, Elizabeth and Dylan do not want to have anything to do with the mask. But when they walk around, they hold it, they keep it here. And when they're walking with nobody's around, they put it down. So a little boy kept going to his mother constantly saying, mommy, mommy, please put your mask back on. Please put your mask back on. You're going to die. I don't want my mommy to die. And, I, and everybody, all the mothers looked at each other. Then he ran away. And I said, Elizabeth, take him away. Take him away. And they were all went running around. And I said to her, I said, without making, saying names, I said, but why would he say that to you? You're going to die if you don't wear your mask? What, what is this? That's not healthy. Well, that's not also healthy at all. Think about houses where, you know, people are being real with their kids and saying, it's okay, you can go out, you know, you're going to be fine. But then those kids now go into schools where they're masked all day and that is reinforced all day long. The masks right. are for safety, the masks are for protection. Without the mask, either you could get sick or you could get someone else sick. Mm -hmm. What a horrible social dynamic. I actually heard someone in the other, I think it was Joy actually on The View the other day said something like, I'll be wearing a mask in, you know, indefinitely in public places because why do I need a cold or a flu either? That's horrible. First of all, you need to encounter germs in order to build up your immune system. Your so immune if system, you actually of course. closed of course. yourself off to all germs, your immune system would suffer enormously just from a, you know, physical perspective. But other than that, who wants to live in that world? Yeah. Masked people in, no, I mean, that's no. crazy, and, un crazy and wildly unhealthy. That's so, you know, adults can... It's amazing. Adult paranoia really has has had an enormous damaging effect on children. And I, I wonder at one point, at what point will the guilt creep in when people start to realize the long term damages that have been will done? Will they? Will the guilt creep in? I think so. Yeah, yeah I think I so. Hope so. I do. I, hope I do so. think so. In more people than we realize. Yeah, especially when long term data is revealed. Um, and, and now you have these vaccine and booster mandates, too, that are affecting children when we don't have long term data on that stuff. What we do have long term data, what we do have data on from the start of the pandemic to now is that the disease is just not that dangerous for children by a long shot that we know. So, you know, if you're going to give them anything, we need to really have enough data to make sure it's safe for them because they're growing, they're developing, you know, into little people. And it's extraordinary what's been done. Um, it really is. Listen, we've arrived to Heather's questionnaire. I'm going to ask you. I know you don't have a lot of <laughs> uh -oh. time. So I'm going to ask you some questions. It's fundamental yeah. spontaneity. You have to say exactly what you think at that moment. What okay. goes into your mind? So uh -oh. This is dangerous, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> Let's what do, do you it. What do you consider, thank you, what do you consider the most overrated virtue? Oh, gosh. Um... <laughs> Oh my gosh, Heather, this is really hard. Overrated? <laughs> yes. Um, studiousness. Why? Studiousness? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I spent most of my life being a really good student and memorizing and, mm -hmm. you know, being obsessed with school. And honestly, I, I left I, the Ivy League and had no idea how to do anything practical. Right. So education, like the perception of education needs to change. You don't need to be a bookworm. Right. Get out into the real world and learn how to okay. do something. And that's much more valuable to me. Okay. So which living person do you most despise? <laughs> I don't despise anyone, honestly. I mean, I, I don't have that chip. There are politicians I don't like. Like, I don't mm -hmm. like you know, Hillary Clinton, you know, what she brings to the table. But I don't, I don't have that. I don't really, I can't think of anyone I hate, okay. truthfully. Okay. I said despise. <laughs> I didn't say hate. <laughs> oh, yeah, despise. I don't, I can't, I know one really. Um, okay. I hate what they stand for. I hate what they okay. do. I hate their policies. But right. I don't know anyone personally well enough to say I despise them. Okay. On what occasion do you lie? And it could be a white lie, but on what occasion do you lie? Sometimes like for to my baby, if I'm like, if I, you know, if I have to leave the house and I'm like, mommy's going to be gone for a little bit. I'll be like, I'm going to go get you avocados. That's where I'm going. You know, that's why, of course, I, it's because I have a doctor's appointment or I have a work call or I have something right. like this that I'm going to do. But you know what I do because I hate lying so much. I'll run out and also get the avocados. So I'm like, oh. see, I, I, 
<laughs> I also, you know, like I just can't. I'm not like a good, a, a great, you know, I would be a good liar because I'm a pretty good actress, but I don't like it. So, but that's what that happens pretty regularly with little stuff like that. <laughs> okay. Two more questions. What is yeah. your greatest regret? Not staying in LA and doing the whole acting thing and letting myself either succeed or stumble for sure. So you really wanted to be an actress, actress, like a dramatic actress yeah, I wanted, or a comedian? I did. I'm you not did? a comedian. No, my comedic timing no. is quite poor actually, but, um, Who, who's yeah, your, who's I your wanted, like idol? Who's the actress that you look at and you go, wow, that's who I would like to be. Who I would have liked to have been. Well, I love Rachel McAdams, but I would definitely oh not my be a Rachel God. McAdams. Oh, that movie with uh, Diane Keaton and uh, Sarah Jessica Parker, uh, Home for the oh, Holidays. Oh, yes. I just watched that the other day. Oh yeah, God, she's I amazing now. Movie. Isn't she? And also, my favorite, my favorite movie, The Notebook. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's my, that's my, that's my favorite. Um, oh. But yes, I, I love her. I would never be like a Rachel. Like, she's like very like. She has that like small town, like beautiful innocence. Right. Um, I grew up in Brooklyn, so I'd probably be playing a much edgier <laughs> Rachel McAdams. But, but yeah, she, I love her. Okay, and last question. What is your idea of perfect happiness? Peace. Um, I increasingly even look at uh, pictures in Hartley's favorite books and like there'll be some pictures where there's like a meadow and just greenery and nature and it actually like shifts my mood like i right. feel an endorphin rush so p I'm, I'm increasingly more passionate about peace and just feeling like maybe i'll make less money by you know prioritizing that because mm -hmm. this is a crazy business but mm -hmm. um it's really really important to me at this stage of life I don't know how to thank you, Jedediah. I'd, I'd hug you. I, you. I can't so wait. I hope one day <laughs> to meet you in person because you're, you're an ex extraordinary woman. I really, really admire you. And I want to tell everybody to remember about Dear Hartley, Thoughts on Character, Kindness, and Building a Brighter World, an incredibly beautiful uh, cover. And Jedediah, my heart goes out to you. Thank you. Mwah. I send you huge kisses. And thank, thank you so much you. for being on Heather's Thank you. And I would give you a, I'm Italian, so I'd give you that <laughs> hug right back. You know right, how without we a are. Mask. <laughs> without a mask, right? <laughs> no mask. No mask needed. Thank you so much. It was a joy thank to be you. with you today. Bye-bye. Heather Parisi okay. live with Jedediah Bila. Bye. Thank you guys.